But yes, I'll go ahead and kick it off. So guys, uh, first off, thanks for, for joining to, to make a quick introduction. I am uh, Mike Conway. I am the, uh, the channel account manager here at Digital Guardian. Uh, a couple familiar faces on the line today uh, who I know from being an account manager, uh, sales rep in a, a previous role. So for those of you who I know already, great to see you again. And for the, uh, the new faces joining, we're, uh, we're ha very happy you can join as well. Uh, great event plan today, uh, at least we think so. So I'll just give a, a quick agenda. So we're going to start things off by, uh, by going through our data trends in the new remote workforce presentation. That's going to be presented today by Tim Bandos. Tim Bandos is the CISO for Digital Guardian. Uh, quick overview for Digital Guardian in case Digital Guardian is new for you. We are a next gen uh, DLP vendor that employs what we call a no policy, no problem approach uh, to data protection. So what that means, because I know it's a little marketing tagline-esque, uh, is that we remove the headache of having to do data discovery in advance of DLP deployment. Um, so without having to write a policy, we give our clients the deepest visibility on the market. That allows them to see where their critical data is, see how it's being used, and then also know where it's at risk. So when you get to the point of deploying policies, rolling out policies, you can put the right policy in place to protect the right data. Um, with that model, we provide more holistic data protection and faster time to value than any other DLP on the market. Uh, the next piece of the presentation is going to be actually a quiz. We're going to spring a pop quiz on you. So uh, right after Tim's presentation, uh, Castle Ventures is going to send over a quiz titled Interesting Figures in the Information Security Landscape. Uh, so what we're going to do to raise the stakes a little bit is we are going to give a, uh, a special gift to the person who gets it in quickest and has the highest score. So you got to meet both those criteria. Uh, but just a little bit about Castle Ventures. I'm sure many of you know Castle Ventures, but they are a managed security service provider uh, with a commitment to identifying and protecting your critical data. Their team has extensive technical expertise and a knack for integrating security systems. Their unique approach and proprietary tools provide visibility uh, into your data and enable you to make clear information security decisions. And yes, I did crib that from their uh, their LinkedIn page. That's uh, okay. But I just got to say, uh, I I personally worked with with them for about six years now at two different companies, and I can just really attest to the fact that Arthur and the team at Castle Ventures are second to none. Um, you know, I, I brought them in a previous role. I bought, brought them into to many of our clients who needed to see more value from their solution. And everyone came out the other end very pleased with the work that Castle Ventures does. That Ventures does. So can't say enough good things about them. Uh, and then after that, next comes the fun part, the wine. Um, so we're going to do a, a virtual tour of, of Italian wine country. That is going to be led by Chris Conway. Chris has over 15 years experience in the wine industry and is currently with MCF Rare Wine. It's a shop in the West Village that has been recognized uh, by both the Wall Street Journal and New York Magazine as one of the best in New York City. So if you're in the West Village and you need some wine, definitely check them out. You're also gonna notice from the last name and the, uh, the remarkably similar voice that I am very guilty of nepotism. But despite my dubious ethical standards, I think you're gonna find Chris very knowledgeable about wine today. And then after the uh, the tasting, we're gonna um, we're gonna do an open uh, discussion. So like I said, we've got Tim here. Tim is our CISO. Tim's got a really interesting history. Tim was um, Tim was at a Fortune 50 company. He was uh, Digital Guardian's best customer. He joined Digital Guardian. He built out our endpoint detection and response platform. He ran our managed services platform, uh, and he's been recently appointed our CISO. So. If you have any questions, comments you want to make, um, you know, anything you want to discuss with uh, the CISO of a security vendor, Tim is going to be here to, uh, to answer those questions. But speaking of Tim, without further ado, ado, I'm going to pass things off to Tim, and he's going to go through the data trends in the new remote workforce presentation. Yeah, and Tim, before you begin, this is Arthur. I, I'm going to unpanelist everyone while we do presentations, and then we'll open it up again as, uh, you know, we start drinking and stuff. So I'm going to change everyone back to attendees. So when you start to stop seeing things, you'll know why. All right. Thanks, Tim. All right. Sounds good. Sick. Like Host disabled participant screen sharing. I can't screen share. <laughs> okay. Uh, wow. 
Let me see if I can do change that. Is Tim still a panelist? Yes, Tim is still a panelist. He should be yeah. able to share, I believe. Yeah, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. I'm going to make you the host. Make me the man. All right. What? Sounds good. Then, then you're going to have to change me back to the host. Not doing it. Okay. All right, here, cool. we, all right, here we go. Can you share now? I, can, I think I can share now. All right. One cool. Side. Uh, there we go. All right, cool. Let me know when you guys can see that. You guys we see my screen? See it. Yes. Good. All right, let's kick it off so we can start drinking. All right. <clears throat> so uh, what are we going to talk about? Distributed data loss prevention. Uh, we, so Digital Guardian did a, a data trends report looking at data um, from our customers. I'm going to get into that in a moment. Uh, let me just kind of kick this off uh, real quick on who I am. So Thanks for the introduction, Mike. So I'm the, the CISO for Digital Guardian. I manage kind of our, our risk compliance, our, ma our risk management, internal security for, for DG. Uh, but I'm also the VP of Managed Security Services. And this is where we get our wealth of data. So, so basically, I run a, a cyber SOC, a global cyber SOC that monitors telemetry for millions of endpoints. Um, and, and endpoints basically generating traffic or anomalous behaviors uh, in reference to data egress. So as files are moving throughout a network, um, you know, transferring files to USB devices or uploading them to you know, network shares, we basically monitor all file type activity in an effort to, to avoid data loss, right? <clears throat> um, but really, what is the intention of an insider threat program, right? It's to deter, detect, and mitigate compromises of sensitive and classified information by malicious insiders. And it's not just malicious insiders. You know, there's actually a, a bunch of different types of insiders that we're typically concerned with. So you have the malicious ones who, you know, for whatever reason, right, want to steal information and kind of move on. Uh, you have the inside agents, which I think is actually one of the most interesting ones. So that's malicious insiders recruited by external parties to steal. Uh, then you have disgruntled employees, uh, careless workers who, you know, mistakenly, uh, you know, send data off to, to a location where they shouldn't be, and then also third parties. Um, I can say, though, over the last 15 years, out of all of these, I think the most interesting stories, without a doubt, come from the inside agents. You wouldn't think this actually happens, but it totally does. Um, you know, when I was working for my Fortune uh, 50 company, I was the director of security over there. I was responsible for data loss prevention. Um, but we had this case where it was a, a state-sponsored breach. Uh, and basically, a, you know, a threat actor had gotten into the environment. Um, but we, we didn't uh, we couldn't understand how they knew uh, where the data was residing. There was basically this compressed zip file of all this confidential information that was sitting on this network share. Uh, and they basically just went right for that and attempted to exfiltrate it. Fortunately enough, we were actually able to stop that. But the question of how that data was um, you know, staged there and just sitting there was, was kind of a, a puzzling for us. We, we used DG agent logs, and this was back in 2008, 2009 timeframe. And we were able to determine that a year prior to that event, there was actually an implant employee uh, that was sitting out of our Iowa office uh, who had actually transferred that information and just basically left it there. He compressed all this data and, and just stored it there. Um, this is an individual who was actually working for the Chinese government alongside also the company that he was working for where I was working. Uh, so we were actually determined that this was an inside agent job, someone who also helped the threat actor get into our environment and also position the data to, to actually steal it. So just kind of a crazy story, but we've got millions of those. I'm going to go into a couple of those too throughout the presentation. So what I do is I oversee all of our, our MDR services, our managed detection response services. We do eyes on glass, proactive threat hunting, incident response services. But this is where we're getting all of our information from. You know, we took a subset of our, our data. There was around 45 billion events that we looked at across half a million endpoints, you know, half a million users uh, across 200 plus customers. And, and really what we looked at uh, was the time frame between January 1st and March 31st. So, you know, right before COVID hits into the time when COVID definitely hit and everyone's kind of in a panic. And, and people are working remotely. And we, we identified some interesting trends, you know, during that time period. Um, and, and rightfully so, right? As individuals were working more from home, we saw a 38% increase in, in employees using their printer, right? Sending data egress to their home printing devices. You know, a 23% increase into NAS storage. So data egress to like personal tax storage devices like Drobo, Synology. Um, but more drastically, right, were the network uploads. We saw a 72% increase in people uploading things to Dropbox, you know, Google Share Drive. Basically all these different repositories that weren't commonly used when, when they were working, you know, in, in the 
corporate offices. Uh, so this generated a ton of alerts for us, you know, in terms of investigations and having to notify our customers, and then also 47% increase in email egress. And what I mean by that is, you know, individuals who are attaching, uh, you know, sensitive material and sending it not to necessarily an employee in the company, but sending it to external, uh, you know, email accounts like their Google account or their Yahoo account. So this is pretty significant, right, in terms of, of data movement trends, which is something that we've never seen before, right, over the last at least five years that, that I've been doing this. Uh, the most, though, um, was USB transfer. We saw a 122% increase right since January, and, and that's absolutely significant. So a lot of individuals were transferring files, of course, to, to you know, removable media devices and whatnot. Now, the way that we also broke down that data is we also looked at you know, whether or not these files were classified or unclassified. So did it contain sensitive material? And that's the beauty of you know, having a data loss prevention you know, utility, um, you know, having something to, to be able to classify information uh, whether it's unstructured data or structured data, where it, you know where it's coming out of a you know a, a sensitive repository, right? We can tag files and track those tags throughout the life of that document. In this particular case, we're able to see that of that uh, you know 122% increase, right, in USB removable media, you know 74% of those documents were actually classified, and that's significant if you think about it. I mean, a majority of the documents that are being sent to you know USB uh, were, were sensitive in nature, and that's concerning for a lot of companies, right? I mean, the whole point of having an insider threat program and, you know, purchasing DLP software is to kind of contain that. Uh, but it comes down to maturity as well. And a lot of companies weren't really ready yet to, to put, you know, things into block mode or they weren't ready for this work from home type, you know, scenario. Uh, so so a, lot of, a lot of activity was occurring and it really required a lot of, it, you know, instant response and investigation uh, because of it. And then we looked at the total data exfiltrated, and this is where it gets, you know, kind of crazy, right? You, you look at these numbers here, you know, looking at the number of files that were uploaded to things like Dropbox, 336 terabytes of information, um, you know, that was observed. Now we saw around 5.6 million of those events being like a rule violation for for one, of, you know, for our customers, and then we had 2.4 million blocks on that data. Um, so so out of that, you know, you think 336 terabytes, only 2.4 million, you know, being blocked. I know I didn't provide the total there, but it was still a significant number that did get through those blocks. And once again, it comes down to having, you know, a mature program over time, right? Gaining visibility to where your sensitive material, you know, resides, identifying risky user behavior, uh, and then putting policies in place, right, to prevent that going forward. Um, a lot of companies now are in this position where they want to be more proactive. They want to start, you know, blocking these types of behaviors that, that really aren't legitimate, or at least setting up services where, you know, employees can transfer things, you know, in a secure manner and have them stored where, they're not going to be exposed or, or, you know, where they're going to be stolen, essentially. Uh, from an analyst perspective, we provide what I like to call high fidelity threat notifications across our customers. So when we see something without a doubt that it looks like, you know, an individual is actually stealing information or data, uh, you know, we provide these tickets. And, you know, you look in January through February up into March, like it's skyrocketed. I mean, it almost doubled, right, since January. And that was a lot of work, right, for them, for us to do all these different investigations. These are some of the things that we were identifying. So, you know, network transferred uploads of CAD design drawings, you know, classified PDF files going to Gmail accounts, uh, you know, high volumes being sent to data removal. So, you know, out of all these notifications, right, I mean, these are the, basically the tickets that we would write up uh, and send to our customers, which would require, of course, further investigation right on, on the customer's part. And we, we'd work alongside with them uh, just to make sure that something wasn't actually stolen uh, and leaving the company. Um, we also have some some trends around MDR. So, um, you know, one thing when I came over to Digital Guardian was I wanted to build our endpoint detection and response capability. So, you know, basically having the ability to do uh, incident response, you know, forensic investigations uh, as it relates to malware uh, and, and compromises to, to endpoints. We did see a 41% increase in, you know, malware detection as, as rel relative to our virus total integration. Uh, we saw a 27% increase in phishing attempts. Uh, and, and our incident response uh, team went, you know, through the roof. I mean, over 50%. 4% uh, from what we're typically used to. And we had to staff accordingly. We were, we were hiring, you know, during the COVID time period when a lot of companies were kind of coming down to a slow and, you know, really were unsure. We had to hire people in order to kind of accommodate, right, all the different investigations and things that were being thrown at us. So, so those, those are some pretty interesting trends, right, as it relates to, to you know, malware investigations and whatnot. You know, when we looked at the headlines, breaking news everywhere, I mean, this is something that we were seeing almost daily. Uh, and, and a lot of threat actors were, 
you know, basically leveraging this this COVID themed uh, event to to send phishing attachments, phishing emails, uh, attempting to lure basically employees to click on links or open attachments. I can say over the course of you know all the years that I, I've ran IR, uh, a majority of these cases, I would say 80% of them came uh, as an entrance vector through an employee clicking on a link or an attachment. I mean, it's by far one of the weakest links in any I think corporate security chain. It's phishing, right? I mean, that, that's really what ultimately opens up the door. Uh, I almost don't care how much money you you spend or throw at security. There's always going to be some vector that is open to to a threat, but that is a ginormous vector that could theoretically be closed with you know security awareness training, you know, having email filtering. There's a lot of things that could be put in place to to prevent that. Um, but without a doubt, this is one of our, our largest that we saw in terms of you know attacks getting in into a corporate environments. Um, so as I mentioned, right, coronavirus themed phishing emails, we saw malware overriding system master boot records, making it unbootable, uh, especially an increase in ransomware activity uh, targeting healthcare, which is completely unfortunate. Um, you know, we've, we've got a variety of healthcare uh, customers and um, they don't specifically, some of them don't specifically leverage just for EDR, uh, where we're actually responding to ransomware incidents, but we got a lot of clients signed on, you know, during this time because they were experiencing all of these ransomware related incidents, uh, really you know, what threat actors commonly do is they target these open uh, servers that have RDP remote desktop port wide open and, and, and they just walk right in, unfortunately. They pound away at it and they get in and they move laterally and then they basically deploy ransomware to, to the healthcare uh, environment. Uh, and this is unfortunate because it, it kind of puts them in a bind, right, in terms of response and, and what do they do because, you know, they're trying to save lives and do all these other things right during COVID, uh, you know, while you have threat actors basically, um, you know, monetizing on, on this unfortunate event. This is what we've seen commonly for, you know, from a COVID phishing perspective. I mean, you know, I'm assuming most of uh, the individuals on this call, when we read this, it, it, I mean, who is going to click on this document, right? I mean, you kind of read through this, they even called it CODIV 19 testing. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't think like that. But, you know, when you read through this, it, you know, these things can stand out. And this is where it comes down to kind of having, you know, security awareness and training and, and making sure that employees are aware of, you know, that this stuff is commonly going on almost every single day. And some of the, you know, the signs to kind of look out for, right, in terms of, you know, what, what not to click, uh, you know, as, as, as emails come into, into the environment. So mitigation techniques, uh, just to name a few, um, you know, I always recommend mitigating against data theft and cyber threats through, you know, these several ways, right? You know, having strict, uh, strict policy enforcement. Um, you know, I know this is a really difficult one to achieve in the real world, you know, when you're, you're blocking USB media devices or blocking things to network uploads. But, you know, once again, you know, to kind of get to that state where you don't have to be concerned about, you know, data theft or, you know, data being uh, basically stolen or, or leaving the network, you, you kind of need to get to that state, right, where you're proactively taking, um, you know, measures to, to prevent that sort of activity. Uh, targeted policy enforcement, you could also target your, your enforcement to only files that have been classified. Um, doesn't mean that all your files uh, are getting blocked or you have strict enforcement. I mean, you just maybe, you know, apply those protections around your most sensitive information in the environment. So that's, that's always, a, you know, a common recommendation from us as well. Uh, employee awareness, as I was mentioning earlier, around data monitoring, though. Um, you know, I, I know this one could go either way, right? Do you want your employees knowing that you're being monitored or, or not? Uh, I've always saw this actually be a, a positive effect because if employees know that they're being monitored, uh, a portion of those data theft attempts actually dramatically goes down. Um, you know, when I was working at, at my last company, we had over 200 plus employee investigations uh, per year. I mean, it was astronomical. As, as people would leave the company, that was one of the first things they would do is they would transfer all of this data to a removal media drive, and then they, they would think that they were going to go on to a competitor and steal that information. Um, we started publishing those types of stories out in newsletters to say, you know, look, this individual, and we didn't necessarily name names, but we identified, you know, employee leaving the company and stealing this data to go on. Like we wanted to at least enforce that, that, you know, awareness. And we saw a dramatic shift, right, in employee behavior. Um, so, so there is some positive to, to also, you know, employees knowing that there is a monitoring or, you know, if some people might call it big brother, but, you know, having something like that in place is, I think, absolutely imperative. Otherwise, you know, your information is just going to leave. Um, also, you know, that's basically what I was talking about is publishing those internal things. And then finally, uh, generating a report of all data egress by a user leaving the company. So, you know, if you have software that is monitoring all data egress, you know, type events and file 
movement, you know, as they're leaving the company and you have your exit interview with that employee, you have a report readily available and say, hey, how come you transferred, you know, 10 gigabytes of data, you know, to this device? We want this back. Um, I think this is, is also a huge deterrent, right, prior to an individual leaving the company. Um, you know, and once again, unfortunately, during COVID times, as people are, you know, being laid off or furloughed, you know, this is the reality. I mean, this is what we're seeing all the time now. Um, you know, people are moving on, you know, to their next, you know, position, but that doesn't mean that they're allowed to also take the, the, the corporate data right along with them. So, so these are just some recommendations around mitigating, um, you know, data theft uh, as it relates. And that's it. Any questions at all? <clears throat> yes, there are a couple, Tim, that I'll read out. So one was the work from home data movement uptick influenced at all from a split tunneling setup, either because it was misconfigured or intentional. So the data theft from a split tunnel. Yeah. So yeah, you're I saying work from home and you're connecting through VPN. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, we didn't see that. I could see how that would happen, though, because when you're directly on the network, you have all these other controls kind of in place. You're being blocked by proxies. Um, that's an absolutely great question, because if you don't have, you know, if you have a split tunnel going on and you don't have that uh, enforcement, you know, going on in, in terms of uploading, then, yeah, the, the data would leave, uh, you know, the, the network. And I think that definitely is a part of it. I can't definitively say that because we haven't been able to kind of link those two things. Uh, but that is a great question. Okay. And then here's a the second one. Is there any new recommendations on how to safely use, you know, online data stores such as Box, Dropbox, Google, et cetera? Specifically, we, and we don't have an enterprise contract with one of those providers for our organization um, that have been highlighted for when business needs require usage, you know, in addition to encrypting documents. You know, any, how, how do we safely use Box if we're not, you know, let our our employees use Box if we don't have a Box contract, right? They're doing a deal with another organization, and that company uses Box. How do we how do we handle that? Yeah, I mean, I, there, besides there's a, my Digital Guardian, <laughs> no, no, I, yeah, I hear that. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a variety of means. I mean. From a DG perspective, I know what we would do is we would encrypt things in transit, right, as they're going to box so that they only could be decrypted, you know, via an agent utility. Um, you know, having encryption as the, you know the files are, are leaving is is your best bet, unfortunately, right? Because once it goes up there in clear text, it's being stored in um, you know a repository that might not even be owned corporately. You know, if it's you know someone's personal drive, it's always going to be stored there. And if they move on, you know, to a next company, they're still going to have access to that data. Um, so you know, I, I think first and foremost, you need, there needs to be a policy in place in the company and there needs to be, need, need, needs to be awareness uh, being sent out so that employees do know what, what basically the rules are around, you know, data handling and, and data transit. Uh, otherwise, they're just going to do whatever they want. So I think at least having an answer for employees is the first thing that needs to be solved, right? Like you need to have that policy in place. Like this is the, this, maybe you just choose one, right? Like box.com is, you know, what we're going to standardize on. Uh, and that's what we're going to, you know, kind of proceed with. You know, I've seen, um, you know, customers use CASB type solutions where you have, you know, some additional insight into uh, on, you know, online or, um, you know, online storage, uh, you know, type uh, services. Um, but either way you look at it, it's going to require some sort of technical solution, unfortunately, right? You're going to have to have to purchase something that either gains you that visibility, applies encryption, or has some sort of policy, right, in place where it prevents it, you know, from going to other uh, locations. Sure. All right. You want to turn it back over and make me the host again. So if you click on my name and uh, click on the more, hover over it and hit on the more button, you can make me host. Your host. All right. Cool. Um, so, Paul, why don't you send out the, uh, the surveys to people? I just hit send. All right. Cool. Um, and I'm going to go back and finish making everybody else attendees. Sorry. Um, so while he does that, uh, again, give me 30 seconds here, and I'm going to start to make this smaller. All right. Um, all right. I think we're back down to the, to the presenters at some level. So again, my name is Arthur Hedge. I'm the president of Castle Ventures. We're a cybersecurity consulting company very much focused on data protection. We're a data-centric organization. We 
you know, partner with organizations like Digital Guardian because they care about data and we primarily serve organizations that care about data. I mean, we don't do much work with, you know, manufacturing companies or things like that. We do a lot of work in financial services, health insurance, health care, those organizations where the information is valuable and needs protection. Um, and as you know, you get this trivia question from Paul. Um, one of the things that, uh, I like kind of the history of, uh, you know, information technology and the and the stories behind the people that are doing that. Um, and while we're we're going through and um, evaluating, you know, the quiz and and trying to answer that as best you can and as quickly as possible, I want to read you a story about uh, you know the interesting characters you run into in the information security space. So I'm sitting in a meeting, this is in 2015, and email pops up on my screen and, it, and I'm gonna read this because I think it's interesting. It says, you, you are receiving this email because you have had at least a small part in shaping my life. In retrospect, I have come to the conclusion that I am the product of everybody around me. I never had a grandiose plan. I just reacted to the ideas and plans of others. The outcome of all of this appears to be interesting enough to be aired on 60 Minutes. The program will be shown on May 10th at 7 p.m. on CBS and can be viewed on this URL after it's done. For those of you bold enough to venture into German, Der Spiegel TV made its own production, which can be viewed somewhere in the neighborhood of the following link. And he sends me a link to this. German TV station. Not all of this is good or likable. There's nothing to be proud of. I did not make the story, the story made me. But this is who I am and I would like to share it with you. I don't care much for the rest of the world, but 60 Minutes is a good starting point for some endeavors that should allow me to take care of my lovely Trinity who is only four years old. With warm feelings and gratitude, Jack Barsky, AKA Albrecht Dietrich. So this was a friend and client of mine. Um, he was an information technology guy. Turned out he was a KGB spy. Um, he'd come to the United States and he, you know, he, he grew up in East Germany. And uh, at the, you know, in the Cold War and they recruited him. He graduated number one in his class in college in uh, East Germany. And the KGB came up to him and said, hey, how would you like to go to America and become a spy? And, you know, he was raised in East Germany. He, told, he was told that America was an evil empire, terrible place. So he signed up and his first job was to um, come. They, they sent him on an assignment. He was supposed to get a job. This was in 1979 in the Carter White House. OK, he'd never been to America before in his life. Didn't have a passport, didn't have anything. Um, so he shows up here and he, he assumes, an, you know, they'd given him spy training. So he assumed an identity of a boy, Jack Barsky, who was, uh, you know, who had passed away at birth and got his social security number and became a, you know, pretended to be Jack Barsky. He didn't get a job in the White House, but he was, he did get a job in uh, information technology and started stealing um, secrets from the chemical manufacturer that he started working for. But after he was here a year or two, he realized America wasn't such a terrible place. So uh, he calls up his handlers in East Germany and says, you know, I, uh, he said there were only two things that the, the Russians were afraid of, Ronald Reagan and AIDS. So he called them up and said, I've got AIDS. I need to come home immediately. And they said, you're never coming back to East Germany. Um, and so he quits the spy business and, uh, you know, it was eventually, you know, he would get tailed by, by uh, KGB agents every once in a while, threatening to kill him. Um, but he moved into a house, married, had, you know, wife and two kids, moved into a house. And the FBI, you know, had busted, I guess, his superior. And so they had his name and they, they were surveilling him for years, couldn't figure out what he was doing. Eventually bought the house next to him, just like the TV show Americans. And uh, Finally, he got into a fight with his wife. They were taping his phone. She mentioned the thing about him being a spy. The next morning, you know, 10 FBI agents show up at his house, knock on his door. 
he just said, you know, as soon as they open the door, he says, I know why you're here. I'll tell you everything I, you want to know. So he cooperated, cooperated with the FBI. They, the FBI agent who arrested him eventually became a good friend of his. I played golf with him. I didn't even know this was going on. They busted him, you know, 10 years ago. And, uh, and uh, they actually made him a U.S. citizen, let him keep the name Jack Barsky. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the day after the 60 Minutes story, he was a CIO at a utility company. Um, you know, he walked into work on uh, Monday morning and they fired him. I mean, I think he had told his boss he was going to be on, but, uh, you know, obviously they didn't tell him all the details. And he ended up writing a book called uh, Deep Undercover. And, you know, he's now on the security circuit. He goes out there and speaks about being a KGB agent and stuff. But I'll tell you, this is you, you run across some interesting uh, people in this business. So I thought, um, you know, the, the trivia question would be uh, the trivia questions would kind of align to that. Um, Meanwhile, while we give you a couple more times this morning, I noticed that the uh, the Italian police, you know, we're going to deal with Italian wines, had busted a fake uh, wine company that was replicating a famous Italian wine. So I'll have to forward that on to Chris so that he can see that. But uh, so even in the wine business, people are trying to, uh, you know, steal data, essentially the reputation of uh, a company. Uh, that's a premier maker of Italian wine. So that's interesting. Paul, have we, how many people, if any, have responded so far? I have received three responses. Okay. And uh, maybe I'm thinking on the fly here, maybe we should start the wine tasting, give everyone just a couple more minutes to turn them in, and then we come back and go through the answers. Okay. That would be fine by me. Because we still have uh, a lot of people to go. A few people that have not submitted it yet, and we just want to give them time to do it. Okay. So, Chris, do you you're just going to talk, right? We don't need. Yeah, to absolutely. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I'll take it away. I guess. Um, so basically, um, yeah, we're doing a little tour of Italian wines. We're going to go through three regions: uh, Emilia Romagna. Uh, Piedmont and Campania. Um, we're starting off with the uh, Lambrusco, the Podere Cipolla, Denny Bini Lambrusco. So I just wanted to make a note. I had mentioned to everybody to um, put the white wines and the sparkling wine in the fridge ahead of time and then pull it out about 30 minutes before you're going to drink it. And then the red wine, the kind of the opposite, where you put it in the fridge for 30 minutes and then you pull it out and drink it. That's a, a big thing with wine uh, that I like to tell people is just because Red wines in general, you want them to be a little bit chilled so that you're getting the full flavors and aromas of the wine. And then with white wines and sparkling wines, if it's too cold, you're also not getting the full flavor. So you want those to come back a little bit towards room temperature. One of the great um, marketing things in, in uh, cheap beer over the years has been ice cold, refreshing beer. And the reason that they push that angle uh, is because uh, if you have a like less superior product, in the drink world, you want it to be ice cold so it masks the flavors of, uh, of the product. So, um, so with wine, uh, with good wine, you want to be appreciating the flavors. So that's, that's why I gave those instructions explicitly, because I think that's not something that most people know, but it's a super helpful thing to know when you really want to taste a good wine. So, um, so first off, uh, Emilia Romagna is where Lambrusco is from. Uh, that's up just to the Northeast of Tuscany, which is Italy's most famous wine region. Um, it's more of a workhorse region. There's not a lot of super famous wines from there, but Lambrusco is the most famous wine from the region. And in some cases, the most infamous wine from the region because Lambrusco, if you know it, has uh, kind of developed this reputation over the years as this mass produced, cheap, sweet, fruity wine. Um, and they kind of just taste like soda. Um, but Lambrusco done right uh, can produce well-structured, aromatic, super versatile wines um, like the one we have here today. They tend to have these very floral, dark fruited and earthy aromas, um, which I really enjoy. Um, the Denny Binny is a great example of this type of wine. Uh, it has this really cool dark purple color. It's super aromatic. There's these good savory, earthy, balanced flavors to it. It's a wine that really drinks great on its own. Uh, it's good for a cocktail hour, but it is a super versatile food wine. Um, that's one of the things I really love about Lambrusco. It has 
the acidity to stand up to high fat or high acid dishes. Um, and then it also has this touch of sweetness to it too, that helps it with spicier dishes too, and brings out some savory elements in dishes. So it's a super versatile wine. Um, it goes with a bunch of different foods and that's why it's one of my favorites when it's a good one. You have to look for a good Lambrusco. Cause like I said, there's a lot of, uh, not so great stuff out there. Um, specifically the winery Poderi Chipola, they're part of this small but growing cell of artisanal producers in the region. They're kind of fighting back against the uh, old reputation of Lambrusco. And they're working with the older grapes and the older styles. They're taking time in the vineyard, they're handpicking um, and really paying attention to what they're doing. And the product you know, really benefits from that. Um, this one specifically from Poderi Chipola is called the Festa Lambrusco. That's a reference to the dinner party that's on the label. Um, it's made from hand harvested organic grapes, as I said. Uh, they're spontaneously fermented, which spontaneous fermentation is something that um, some wineries do where they let the natural yeast uh, and bacteria that are in the air around the winery and then also in the uh, skins of the grapes just enact the fermentation. A lot of bigger wineries will uh, use these controlled yeast strains to get fermentation going, but a lot of smaller producers are doing this spontaneous fermentation specifically because it brings these really cool qualities to the wines. It kind of creates this really good energy. You get tartar acidity, a little more of a like earthy funk. And I mean funk in the best possible way. It just makes it, it's like a livelier, earthier kind of thing. And it usually gives it this citrusy red fruit kind of energy to it. Um, in non-sparkling wines, it can create a little bit of effervescence. The Lambrusco is obviously a sparkling wine, sparkling wine so the effervescence is, effervescence is already there. Um, and then in another nod to the label, uh, the winery likes to say that this Lambrusco is said to be delicious and a touch bitter, but it goes down easy if you don't overthink it, similar to most family gatherings. That's their, uh, that's their, their line. So, um, so yeah, the pairings in terms of food pairings that I recommend, again, with Lambrusco, it really is, it pairs with nearly everything. Uh, like I said, the acidity and bubbles help with any acid or fat that are in whatever you're eating. It has fruit to go with the spicy cuisine. One thing that I like to mention too in wine is that, um, you know, when you're drinking a local wine from somewhere in the world and you're not sure what to do in terms of the pairings, one of the great things to really do is to find out what the local foods are to the area that the wine is coming from and to just try and pick a recipe or a food uh, from there that goes with the wine. Cause often these are the best pairings. Um, you know, like there's tons of great examples of this. Riesling goes awesome with Wiener Schnitzel. Muscadet or Sancerre goes great with oysters. Um, and the soils that Muscadet and Sancerre are grown in are literally have fossilized oyster shells within them. And they happen to be amazing with oysters. So there's weird little stuff like that in the wine world um, where if you go with a local route, it really helps. And in the case of the Lambrusco, uh, Parmigiano Reggiano cheese and prosciutto are both native to Emilia Romagna. And honestly, just that alone, if you go Parmigiano, Reggiano, Prosciutto, some Lambrusco, awesome pairing, you'll do really well there. But sky's the limit beyond that. Uh, pizza is amazing with lasagna, burgers, barbecue, Korean, Thai, Indian, Chinese, really everything. We often recommend this as a great Thanksgiving wine for people because uh, Thanksgiving is a weird uh, holiday to pair with. Um, there's so many different flavors and different things going on on the table in terms of what you're eating. So Lambrusco is one of those good versatile wines you can throw at Thanksgiving. Um, yeah, so that is, that's the info on the Lambrusco. And then we are going to move, Emilia Romagna is up in the kind of towards the Northeast corridor of Italy, but more in the central spot. Um, we're gonna go down now Southwest to Campania. Um, Campania was an important one for me to get in here because I am a big proponent of Campania wines. Um, it's not, Campania is one of those regions that doesn't get talked about a lot, like the way that Tuscany or Piedmont do, but it's uh, it's one of my, it's maybe my favorite wine region in Italy besides Piedmont. And it offers to me the best pound for pound value in Italy and potentially the world. There's a lot of really cool native grapes uh, in Campania that uh, these producers are working with. They're pretty inexpensive and they're super high quality, super well-structured wine. So I, I, that, I wanted to specifically get a, companion wine in here to uh to remark on that like i said it's in the southwest it's on the uh on the mediterranean sea uh two things of note to campania it's home to naples which is the home of pizza that's where pizza comes from um and all of the wines from campania 
The native varietals pair well with pizza, both the red and the white, so you can never go wrong with that. Also, Mount Vesuvius is in Campania, which is of note when it comes to wine because the soils in Campania are very volcanic because of Mount Vesuvius. And there's a noted specific thing, which is it's scientifically kind of unmeasurable at this point, which is a, soils in general, or there's a lot going on in soils that we haven't been able to measure. But uh, volcanic soils lend a like legitimately mineral smoky element to wines. Uh, this happens in the Canary Islands as well, where there's volcanic soils. And these definitely express themselves in these companion wines. So um, moving along specifically to the one that we're dealing with today, that's the Ormeri Greco di Tufo 2016. Greco is one of the native varietals uh, from Campania. Um, as far as white wines go, Greco tends to be a firmer, more structured wine, which are not terms you usually use with a lot of white wines. Firmer, structured tends to be a red wine term, but they're, as with everything in wine and life, there are exceptions. And Grecos have unusually high tannin for white wines, but they also have this racy, super linear acidity that helps balance out those tannins. Um, you'll often find in Greco these subtle kind of stone fruit aromas, some nice florality. Um, and then you'll see that in this one too, but specifically now this wine in particular, uh, it's a Greco, it's produced from hand harvested organic grapes, just like the Lambrusco. Um, and it's really up there. I put this up against any Greco that you'll find in Campania. Um, it has a super deep color. It's really nicely structured. There's a intensely focused mineral backbone to it. And that minerality really does come from, um, you know, from that volcanic soil that I was talking about. And then it also is super fragrant. It's got some smoke to it. Not some wines in Campania have a super pronounced smoky element. This one is kind of a little bit more subtle. And then there tends to be some more like briny yellow fruit, which that falls in line with the uh, stone fruit thing. There's more like apricot, peachy kind of things that you'll notice uh, as you drink it. On the palate, there's a subtle oily texture um, that I really love in white wines that are really uh, well made. It offers like a good counterpoint to the acidity, which is definitely there. Um, the acidity tends to have a little bit more of a citric kind of flavor. And to me, the texture of the, the oily texture balances out the acidity really nicely. Um, the Ormeri in general, I say it's an, it's an evolved and savory wine, but it's also refreshing, you know, it's, which is evolved and savory is what you want out of a wine with a little bit of age on it. It just starts to develop these cool secondary tertiary flavors and aromas, but then you also want it to still be alive and have some nice freshness to it. And that's the mark of a good well-aged wine is when it's, it feels lively, but then there's also these cool, really subtle aromas gone underneath. So, I um, mean, I think the Ormeri is in a great drinking window right now. Um, this one will get better and better as the evening goes on. It, it tends to breathe super well. And like, as the hours go by, um, more of these really cool aromas and flavors that I was talking about sort of get unlocked. So that's a good one to kind of keep on revisiting as the evening goes on and even, even throw it in the fridge and check it out tomorrow. It'll be, it'll be in good shape. In terms of pairings for Greco, um, any seafood will go really well with it. Um, spaghetti with clams is a favorite. I really love any companion white specifically with a, Cavatelli with hot sausage and brown sage butter. For any of you who lived in New York or live in New York, Frankie Spuntino is a pretty, is a relatively famous Italian restaurant in New York and they do that dish. Uh, and I, I love to go there and get that specific dish with a Campania white. It's a perfect pairing. It's so awesome. Uh, pizza, like I said, Naples pizza will definitely go well with it. And then Whenever anyone asks me for a pairing for chicken Parmesan, Greco is actually my number one uh, choice because it, uh, I think the acidity in it goes really great with like the red sauce in a chicken parm. But then, it, like I said, it's a well-structured wine. So it stands up well with like the, uh, with the poultry element in terms of the chicken. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the word on the Ormere. And then last, but definitely not least, we're gonna go up to Piedmont, which is up in the Northwestern corner of Italy. Uh, Piedmont is one of the great wine regions in the world. It's my personal favorite wine region in the world. Um, it's a stunningly beautiful place. Uh, from the vineyards, you can see the Alps to the north. So you'll see these awesome snow-covered mountains uh, rising into the air while you're standing amongst the vineyards. It's, it's a truly incredible place. Um, Nebbiolo is the most renowned grape in the region. Uh, that's the grape that's in Barolo and Barbaresco, which are the two more famous wines that come from the area. Uh, it has this really great combination of where you get the cold air from the Alps and then the warm air from the Ligurian Sea to the south. It just creates perfect growing conditions where you get 
nice warm weather from the um, sea air during the day and then it cools off enough at night to keep the grapes fresh and give them great acidity. And even uh, Nebbiolo, which is a very high tannin grape, has some great freshness and acidity to it because of these diurnal temperature variations. So, um, but today we're talking about Barbera. That's the secondary grape in the region. Um, but it's not an overlooked grape. A lot of people are kind of know about Barbera these days. Uh, for our customers in general, the easiest way for us to guarantee success on an email is to send a really good Barbera email because it fits this perfect price point and quality thing that I, I love and everybody else seems to too, and rightfully so. It's a fantastic grape. The thing that I think is overlooked about Barbera is it's a more capable grape than most people give it credit for. It's kind of uh, Nebbiolo, or sorry, Barbera is considered to be kind of a grape that you drink young while you're aging your Nebbiolos, which will honestly, the greatest Barolos will age for up to like 70, 80 years. So that's a really long time. But, uh, but Barbera does have like this really good um, acidic profile to it. It doesn't have a lot of tannin, which is, it's the opposite of the Greco. Uh, it's odd that a red wine is mostly acidity uh, based, but Barbera is, um, it's a lighter to medium body grape. Uh, it usually has dark fruits and more savory kind of herbaceous flavors to it. Um, it, it, like I said, it does drink great when it's young, but it has legitimate aging potential. These are well-structured wines. Like uh, wine gets its structure from tannin and acidity and acidity really works. You know, like a lot of, uh, German Rieslings that age for like 30, 40 years, they're all, that's all their uh, acidic structure that's carrying that long. And Barbera is one of those grapes where from really good producers, uh, it really does age super well. This one that we're drinking right now would age for 10 to 20 years if you wanted, if you were like put it in the cellar and wanted to wait on it. Um, so the, specifically with this Bovio Too here. I'm drinking uh, it. Too late, I've already opened it. <laughs> no, no, totally, totally. It's also an ex excellent drink now, like I said. <laughs> um, the, uh, this Bovio themselves are a renowned Barolo house um, and they do an excellent job with their Barolo, but kind of keeping in theme here, I think their Barbera is really overlooked and is maybe their most interesting selection. That's not to knock down their Barolo. I, I highly recommend their Barolos, but this is just to like lift up the Barbera. Um, it's, it's a fantastic wine and it has, it's just such a, you know, it's such a long lived awesome wine that I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Um, in terms of like its taste profile, there is a surprising weightiness, I think, to this wine um, for what I describe as like a, you know, lighter to medium bodied high acid wine there is some weight to it there's some richness to it i think the fruit comes through very well this does fall to the brighter side to me in terms of uh, barbaras rather than those darker cherry kind of fruits that you usually find um there is the herbaceous earthy spicy mineral element that's what kind of adds all those flavors and those layers to it that that lifts it above other barbaras to me as well um yeah and like i said i mean this is one you know to drink now but i a note I would say on like aging of wines, especially in terms of like something like a, like the Bovio Barbera is that this is a relatively affordable wine. And um, often we think of aging wines in terms of like more expensive wines or some singular bottle that you're going to drink within its perfect drinking window. Cause it's, you know, you, you go to a restaurant, it's a $200 bottle and you expect the sommelier rightfully so to, you know, put you in the right lane and give you a bottle that's in its prime drinking window, or you come to a wine shop and we do the same for you. But the cool thing about aging a wine like this that's relatively affordable and you can grab a few bottles of is the fun thing is to follow it along as the years go by. You know, like drink one now, drink one in another couple of years, drink one in five years, drink one in 10 years. You really get to know the wine and follow it along in its evolution, um, which is to me one of the most interesting things about wine. It's how you really get to know wines in a really cool way. Um, and that, that's how like a lot of people are able to seemingly pull that wine magic trick where you like oh you i you know the taste of the wine based on just like taking one sip of it it's similar like if you were eating your favorite pizza you know like you would know blind like oh this is my favorite pizza place is pizza and that that's one way you can go about the aging process with wines that's more approachable and more interesting than the kind of like um you know like just i don't know a little bit more elevated too expensive precious style of aging wines um in terms of pairings for this wine, again, going the local angle, uh, Piedmont has this specific dish they do. It's a uh, tajarine pasta with butter, sage, and truffles. Truffles are also native to Piedmont. So pairing truffles with uh, Piedmont wines is classic and just, you know, like, and it's amazing. It's a, it's a transcendent experience. Um, mushroom risotto, 
goes really well with Barbera. Um, anything mushroomy goes again with Piedmont that works with the truffle angle too. This also is good for darker meats because of the acidity. You can actually do like a nice grilled steak with this. Uh, I love it with roast chicken. It's awesome with darker uh, fowl, like duck or guinea hen too. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's the, that's the deal with the Bovio Barbera as well. And I think that, I think that covers what I was going to say. If anybody has any questions or anything, feel free to send them my way. All right. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to allow everybody else to become panelists now so we can all chat and see everybody. Thank you, Chris. That was really instructive. Absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, I'm, although I'm curious about your low tannins on the uh, Bovio. It, it seems like it's kind of, it, it's pretty good at it, trying out your mouth. It does, it does. There is some tannin on the Bovio for sure. Yeah. I was, I would say more be the low tannin, I would say is like a more generalized Barbera information thing. I think the Bovio does have some, some tannin to it. For good. Sure. There's definitely some structure. I agree with you on that one. Most All right. Time. Yeah. Hey, Chris, I have a question for you. Totally. How do you store the Lambrusco? Because I don't think my wife and I are going to drink three bottles of wine tonight. So the Lambrusco, you want to put in the fridge. That's a wine that you want to drink like relatively cold. So you just throw it in the fridge. It'll stay there for as long as you need it to. Oh, and, then that's, sure. and then you want to pull it out. That's one you want to pull out again, like a half an hour to an hour before you actually drink it. No, it no I mean, now that I've opened it, do I just put a stopper in it to keep oh. it? So, yeah, I mean, if you have a champagne stopper, that's the, 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 the ideal use for the, uh, yeah, for the, for the Lambrusco. But if you do just put a stopper in it, it is going to lose some of the fizziness, but the taste will actually, will still be there. We, we actually, to be honest with you, in the shop, sometimes we will purposely let a champagne that we're tasting uh, lose some of its bubbles just so we can get to the underlying wine underneath it and see what that actually tastes like. So, you're, you may lose the bubbles if you just put a regular stopper in it, but there's still going to be some, you'll still get the flavors and it can be an interesting experiment. Too. Huh. Never tried that. Yeah. It's, 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 it's interesting. You don't want to do it with every wine, but it, it can reveal some things about some wines that you're curious about. It's cool. Yeah. Not um, a question. The Lambrusco. So it's basically a sparkling wine. Should yep. that be served in a champagne glass or not? So I, uh, I do not personally recommend uh, pouring even champagne in champagne glasses because uh, the champagne glasses are so narrow that you don't get a lot of the aromas and it kind of shuts down. They're very, they're celebratory. And like, if you're in a, at a wedding, you're just drinking some random sparkling wine, I'm all for it. But when I drink like a really nice sparkling wine, I absolutely put it in a regular uh, larger glass because it, you... You, you, you can really like get in there and get the aromas and, and it affects the flavor profile as well yeah, too. So. It's a big part of the experience. Yeah. yeah. So I, so I, yeah, I recommend drinking the Lambrusco in a regular wine glass as I do really any good sparkling wine. What about versus a coupe? Like a, a champagne flute versus a coupe? So you, the coup you can totally do. I mean, like, yeah, because that that opens it up a little bit more. You know, you're not going to be able to get it's that good. Swirl. If, if you're in it, you're not going to be able to swirl it around as much, obviously. Um, but you're at least getting some more aromas. I still, but I still say regular wine glass is the way to go because you can swirl it around, get the aromas up, and, and everything, and then, and then also, uh, yeah. Well, I, haven't some of the the French champagne houses started to come up with a third style glass? You know, I I, I don't have one in front of me to, yes. to deal with this exact problem. Yes, totally. Rodier, yes. I think is the one Louis Rodier. I could be wrong, but I think that's the one that came. I think you're right. I think you're right, Arthur. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they there definitely are these glasses. I mean, there are now glasses literally for nearly every varietal of wine out there. Um, I I understand what they're doing. I'm not. I to me that's too much to take on. You know what I mean? Like it's it's, it's like uh, I and I. So that's why I try to just recommend to people. You know, there, there is, they, the, the champagne has this have been working on a way to kind of, you know, best of both worlds where you get a little bit of a more narrow. So, because it does affect the cascade of the bubbles too, if you have the narrower sure. glass. So that's why they do that. And they're trying to get you to be able to like get the full flavor and aromas and also experience the bubbles. So yeah, champagne would be one where I would say maybe sure, I, you know, give the blessing I'm going for the glass because of that. 
but like when people are getting into like, oh, I have a Dolcetto glass and uh, you know, like a, a Gruner glass, then I, I, I lose the thread a little bit on that stuff. So. Hey, don't knock my glass collection. <laughs> Well, he's trying to trick you, Mike. He's been telling you to buy all these glasses because he gets right. a big markup on them. Yeah, he, he, he sells me the glasses, too. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Today Chris, was the reveal. Chris, your place so, uh, is, in West, is in West Village? Yeah, it's in the West Village. It's on uh, West 13th Street, uh, right uh, east of 8th Avenue. And so if I, have a dinner, if I have a dinner in Soho tonight, what yep. questions can I ask the waiter so I look like I know what I'm talking about for the wine list? So if you go to... All right, so... The uh, that's a good question. I mean, what, yeah, what, what get get get, what, get your pen and write them down in your hand. Oh no, yeah, I'm recording this entire <laughs> thing, so don't worry about it. Guys. <laughs> I mean, you can impress the the wait staff or even your date bar by kind of like being like, oh, do you have anything from X importer? You know, if you're like, oh, do you have any Kermit Lich wines? That shows like a insider's knowledge. Um, that's kind of like a that's also a good. That's a good recommendation. That's a good shorthand for when you go into wine shops and you don't know you know so just some random wine shop and maybe the staff isn't too knowledgeable and it's a big selection and you're not sure how to go about things if you learn like a few importers and distributors that tend to bring in good stuff then that's like a shorthand way to deal with the wine world too in terms of like finding you know good wine so that's one way you can go about it. you know it depends on what restaurant you're at like based on the the knowledge expertise of the staff can vary wildly so um yeah I, specific distributor can help out i always cave and i just order the pinot noir i have no idea what i'm doing so i just go yeah give me that. <laughs> totally. Totally. I, i'd like to say two things so first of all i'd like to say that first time i've used this in a long time so i've had this swiss army knife i got at my bar mitzvah when i was 13 years old so <laughs> <laughs> i haven't used this in a long time Second, I'll ask the gauche question that may be on people's minds. Can you talk about the price points for these? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the, the, um, the Bovio Barbera is uh, $25 uh, a bottle. Um, the Denny Bini Lambrusco, I think, is 19 It may be 20 but I th it's like right in that 19 20 range. And then the Greco is either 25 or 26. So these are all in the 20 to $25 price range. So they're all relatively affordable bottles of wine. They're not, um, and I think that they all offer like a lot of structure for, you know, for, for their price too. Okay. So but building wine, upon though, that, when we look at your website, yep. the front page was generally around $60 a bottle. So what do we get for 60 versus 20? So you get, we, we specifically, we're a very well curated shop. Um, you know, we're not, we don't, we're, we're carrying producers that we really believe in. Uh, so we, we value, we do a value thing accordingly. We're like, we, if, if we have a $15 bottle of wine, we think it's great, but we're not going to sell you a $30 bottle of wine. That's the same value as the $15 bottle of wine, because that's kind of like undercutting the theory behind the shop. So with $60 bottles of wine, you're getting, you know, for the most part, superior quality. You're getting something with more structure. Sometimes you're paying for the region and the name for sure. I mean, like that's just a factor in the wine world where, you know, there's there there are uh, some Burgundies that are literally upon release, uh, t close to ten thousand dollars a bottle no, from the top. Higher, higher. Yeah, Roman Conti. Yeah, exactly. Roman Conti gets up to yeah. exactly, exactly. So, so <laughs> like I always say to people, like that wine is not you know, whatever, a uh, hundred, 200 times better than a hundred dollar Burgundy, but there's a supply and demand thing. There's only so many of those wines made and there's very wealthy people uh, that can afford to buy those wines. So, well, you know, we do sell some of those higher end wines and we do have a lot of collector wines, but if you're talking about the one to one, the 10 to hundred dollar range with us, you're talking about pretty, a relatively, you know, like reliable increase in value as you go along. So if you get like a $60 wine, you're going to get a truly $60 wine. Uh, whereas there are plenty of $80, $100 wines out there that I think are worth $15, you know, like, and we, we don't, we don't carry those wines because we, we, at least in our opinion, we, we, uh, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't believe in them in, in some sense. Well, I asked you a question because like the Napa cabs, right? I yes. Mean, it can get ridiculous. Yes. So that's yeah, totally Arthur. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I, 
that's the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, like it, and I, and I try to be equitable, uh, you know, like uh, nice and explaining that to people too, where I'll just be like, Hey, look, if I, if you and I were to open up a vineyard in Napa today, we would have to charge $125 per bottle for our initial vintage just to break even. So there's a real estate land type of thing going on there too, but we're not making a wine that's worth 120. I mean, whatever it's you could as an anomaly, but many Napa wines to me are super overpriced. And it's not that they're bad wines. It's just that they're, you know, you're paying like $85 for a bottle of wine where you can get a uh, Bordeaux uh, from France or even from other off regions. That's $20. That's le legitimately just as good. You know, it's like, where it's, it's a, uh, in a blind tasting, even an expert would be like, Oh, these are similarly qualified wines. So. So, so where's, how, where's how the value today? today? Is it stuff? chili? Is it, sorry. We, the value, to me, the biggest value area is Campania is one of them. Again, you have to, you know, Campania, if you're going to a shop where they know what they're doing, the Canary Islands uh, has some tremendously cool stuff uh, coming out that offers awesome value. Uh, the Loire Valley in France uh, is always a good value buy to me. Those wines are excellent. And uh that's where Sans Serre is from, which is kind of a known entity, but there's a lot of uh, under the radar wines in the Loire Valley. That, and there are some really good Sans Serres, but I actually think Sans Serre is probably the least interesting wine from the Loire, but it's the most popular one. Um, what about so South America or South Africa? You know what? I We basically are Northern, we deal with basically Northern hemisphere wines. I honestly do not have areas of expertise in South America. And I, we carry a little bit of Australian, but I, I can't, uh, expand on that because I, my areas of expertise are Europe, Europe, and, and then the United States to an extent too. So we're, we're a heavily, 60% uh, of our wine is probably Italian and French. And then after that, there's like Germany, Portugal, Spain, U S um, Austria, you know, mostly European wines. We have a Canadian Chardonnay right now. That's phenomenal, but we're, we're a pretty European focus shop and my area of expertise in all the places I've worked in has actually been pretty European focused because it was mostly New York places, which, tends to kind of go for the European stuff. I'm just going to make a comment. The Lambrusco has such a unique flavor profile and is surprisingly, I don't know what the right word is. It's surprising to me coming from a sparkling wine. Just the, the aroma coming from it is, is very intense. It's not what I expected. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you, Paul. I think, yeah, I think it's a very unique wine and it is, and it is super aromatic and intense for, uh, yeah, it has a lot of depth to it. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, excellent. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hey, Chris, how long did it take you to learn all this stuff? Um, I've been working in the wine industry for about 15 years in some capacity. I, I started working at a wine bar uh, back in like the mid in, <clears throat> aughts, uh, in Brooklyn. And I, just, I was doing it as a part-time thing and I, uh, I really knew little about wine. I knew a few California cabs that like my dad was into, you know, and stuff. And I, and I, I remember the first tasting I did there, I tasted this Beaujolais, which Beaujolais is a pretty good value too. Beaujolais has a bad reputation because of Beaujolais Nouveau, but Cru Beaujolais is excellent wine. And you can actually find some, it's getting pricier, but you can still find some value there. But I tasted this Beaujolais and I was like, oh my God, I didn't know that wine could taste like this. And that kind of got me passionate about it. And then I, I was working on and off. I was working with a distributor for a little while. Uh, and then I've been working with MCF Rare Wines for about 10 years. And I kind of helped grow the shop with Matt, the owner. Uh, him and I worked together in Brooklyn about 15 years ago. And he asked me to come aboard and help him out. And I was doing it in a part-time capacity for a while while I was working in uh, the title insurance industry. And then I ended up going full force into wine. So I, I've been working full on in wine for about 10 years now. And, uh, and I've been in it for about 15 years. So it took a, yeah, that's about the time period it took to, to aggregate this information. Nice, man. Any, uh, any additional questions? Who won that survey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Arthur, do you want to walk us through the questions real quick? Uh, sure. Give me a minute to or do uh, pull up the document. Or do you want me to do it? It's up to you. No, I, I'll, I'll do it. Um, I got to find the... So I will there. preface it by saying this was a very difficult quiz. Uh, well, if you read me the questions, I can certainly, well, I can, right. I'll, I'll read them off. 
Okay. So the first question, who invented the Turing machine? Did everyone get that correct? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's the easy question. We want to get you, you know, all ready and, and fired up and ready to go here. So that one was easy. Um, who last employed Edward Snowden before he left the United States? Okay, well, the correct answer is Booz Allen. Um, so Edward Snowden was a contractor working at the NSA for Booz Allen. Before he was at Booz Allen, he had worked for the CIA. Um, I don't believe he ever worked for Deloitte. So he, and that's why I said who last employed him. I didn't say where did he work because that you could answer the NSA correctly. Um, but he worked for Booz Allen as a contractor. Jonathan got that one correctly. Nicely done. Good job. Um, who said treat your password like a toothbrush? Don't let anybody use it and get a new one every six months. How many people got this right? Two. Okay, Clifford Stoll. So Clifford Stoll was one of the earliest people to write about computer security. He was a researcher, I think, at UC Berkeley, and he wrote a book called The Cuckoo's Egg, um, which talked about how you know, he was working at this research facility. Again, I read this book a long time ago. Um, I think it's over 30 years old. Um, but he was a researcher and all these weird things were happening into his data. So he went and he actually was able to, to trace back and he got uh, this chaos computer club in Germany who had been hacking all these US government sites and stuff, he was able to actually identify who it was. So he wrote a book called The Cuckoo's Egg. It's well worth reading if you haven't read it. Who launched the first worm, major worm attack on the internet? Uh, that would be Robert Morris. And, and that technically is Robert Morris Jr. His dad actually, I believe, worked for the CIA or the NSA at the time. He was a student, uh, I wanna sure. say at Dartmouth College and he wrote a, uh, a program that he thought would replicate and was playing with it and he inadvertently launched it on the entire internet. And that was really the first major internet outage back in the 80s, so. All right. Anyone get um, that one right? That was, uh, let's see, uh, three people got that right. Okay, does anyone know who Elliot Alderson is? Oh, what was the, how many did the winner get? Just out of curiosity. Say again? How many did the winner get? Uh, the winner got seven. Okay. Out of, out of what? Out of. Ten, right? Out of nine. Well, if you know your name, you get credit for that. So yes, out of 10. <laughs> All right, so El Elliot Alderson is Mr. Robot. You know, Remy uh, Malik. So that was, I thought that was an interesting thing. All right, the next one. Okay, Paul. the term spam as it relates to email comes from what book, TV show, or movie? Are we gonna, sing? Python's Are we gonna sing now? I think we all need to sing. Four people <laughs> no, spam. we're not gonna sing. Four spam, people got spam, that right. spam, spam. I'll yeah. have the spam and the baked beans and the spam, please. And, and it's beans. also where the, you know, the Python programming language comes from. Guido Van Rostrum, the inventor of Python, loved Monty Python, so. Oh, that I didn't know. That's a good piece of trivia. Yes, and, and does anyone know what his title is? I mean, he has an official title in the Python, you know, programming world. No volunteers? I'm gonna go with head knight of the round table. That's close. He's called the Benevolent Dictator. So. <laughs> That's a very good guess. So he was right. close. Who is Citizen Four? Well, that's Edward Snowden. I, probably a lot of people got this. Nope, only one person got that right. Wow. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, this was the toughest question of them all. Which of the terms does not refer to the information unit containing either one or zero? And nobody got that one correct. Wow. So what was the number one guest answer? Um, it was Shannon. Wow. Okay. Does anyone know who Claude Shannon is? The Shannon principle, right? Well, what's the Shannon principle? 
I don't know. It's you know one of those things where you. Uh, no, I don't. I don't know. There probably is a Shannon principle. There's a Shannon number. The Shannon number represents the number of possible moves in chess, which is more than the particles there are in the universe. And Claude Shannon proved that, but that's not what he's known for. Uh, he's the first person actually to use the word bit in a published uh, article in 1948. It had nothing to do with computers. He was an engineer at Bell Labs trying to figure out how to reduce noise and static on the line. And he said, and he's the reason we're all here and why we have problems. He said, um, you know, the, the way to solve this problem is to convert everything into zeros and ones, you know, and the electrical signals into zeros and ones. And that way we can do analysis on it and we can remove all the meaning, you know, from your voice and we'll translate it into zeros and ones and we can put in error correction and we can detect, you know, we can do statistical analysis on randomness and so on and so forth. But essentially the, the what happened is he removed all meaning from the data itself. So it's impossible to tell whether those zeros and ones that are going out of your network are good or bad. So whether they're encrypted or not, you can't tell just by looking at the data. So, you know, he's kind of the reason why we can't stop people from stealing stuff. Um, and so he used the word bit, so, or he invented the, he, he claims he didn't invent the word bit. Uh, it was actually his boss, but uh, at Bell Labs, but he was the first person to use it in writing. And he made it a, 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 an abbreviation, I guess, where he actually called it a portmanteau of binary digit. So he took the word binary digit and he turned it into a bit and that's where that comes from. Obviously bool, I think is the trick question. This is the one that I meant that, that uh, Tim from uh, Digital Guardian, he took the test before. I think Tim's actually the highest scorer we've had of the test, so congratulations, Tim. Um, he he was tricked by this question too because people think Boolean algebra, but uh, Bool doesn't represent anything. So, uh, but people. Well, it's a French it, lo it's a French lo loaf of bread. Uh, that is true. So, <laughs> but it's not a one or a zero. Um, so, yeah. Who claimed responsibility for the Sony Pictures hack? The Guardians of Peace. Uh, Whether they actually that. did it or not, nobody knows, but uh, they, they claimed a responsibility for it. Right? How many Hitting people got that right? What? How many people got that? Two. Hmm. Yeah. Did How many people guessed Hidden Cobra? Uh, one. Okay. Because that's the other one that, you know, there are people who think they're the, gr the group. Well, Hidden Cobra is the malware, I guess, that a Korean hacking group uses to attack U.S. government facilities that we have a U.S. government, uh, I don't know how we call them, service provider or whatever. And they're the only client we ever see get attacked with Hidden Cobra malware. But um, Hidden Cobra, you know, has not claimed any responsibility or whatever. The group that, that built that malware has not claimed it. So the Guardians of Peace said they did it. Who knows if they actually did, so. And the final question, what was Digital Guardian's previous name? Does Mike Conway know this? I'm going to go with Vertisys. All right. Good job. Probably about what? Uh, at least five or six years before I joined. Yeah. So three people got that correct. Okay. So the winner.